So, a challenge today is to be able to describe the effect of atmospheric pollutants on our atmosphere. Our aspire is to be able to evaluate the use of fuels linked to atmospheric pollutants. But to do this, we first have to look at what pollution is. Air pollution is typically produced when we burn fuels in a process called combustion. Lots of fossil fuels contain sulfur impurities, which can also react during that process. The conditions during burning can cause the formation of different products, and each of those products will cause a different effect on the earth. Now, you might remember the fire triangle from when you were in primary school or even earlier down in school. For fire, which is a combustion reaction, we need three things. We need heat, fuel and oxygen. And if you change any of those factors, then it will change the, co the combustion reaction itself. If you remove any of those fa factors, it will actually stop the fire itself. So this is the rationale we use when we are trying to put out fires. So we are normally trying to take away the fuel or the oxygen so that the fire stops. In this case, it's going to be the oxygen that we're going to actually look at changing levels of. Because if you have high amounts of oxygen or low amounts of oxygen, you get different products from that reaction. First thing, I want you to have a little bit of a think. I'm going to give you some time to do this. There's two images below. There's a brand new candle and then there's the candle after it's been used a lot of times. I want you to describe what has occurred on that image below and, and have a go at explaining why that change has happened. Okay, so let's have a look at our answer. Because of that, it's forming a different product. So let's start to look at the pollutants that are formed and how they're formed based on that combustion and that fire triangle. So at the end of this section, I'm going to put this up on the screen for you to have a go at completing. So while I'm talking through each of the pollutants, be thinking about what effect is linked to that pollutant and how that pollutant is formed. So we'll start with carbon dioxide. You're probably not surprised to hear this one. Um, carbon dioxide is most commonly known air pollutant and it's produced during what we call complete combustion. Complete combustion is when the fuel has sufficient oxygen. So when there's plenty of oxygen getting into that reaction, it is complete combustion. And there's actually an equation on the screen that you can see that summarises complete combustion. Now, carbon dioxide is known to contribute towards global warming as it is a greenhouse gas. And we will look at global warming in a later video. So just for now, we need to know that it's formed in complete combustion and it's a greenhouse gas which contributes towards global warming. So our next pollutant is carbon monoxide. You may have heard of carbon monoxide. It's known as the silent killer. So you probably have a carbon monoxide detector in your home. Now, carbon monoxide is produced in cases where there is insufficient oxygen. 
So this is an example of incomplete combustion. Carbon monoxide is toxic. And if that area is poorly ventilated, it can build up, which can eventually cause death. So it's not good. That's why we have those detectors in our houses to make sure that if the detector goes off, we can open all the windows and ventilate that room to remove that gas. There's another product of incomplete combustion that is called carbon particulates and it's actually like what we saw on the jar okay so these cause global dimming which is when the amount of light is reduced getting to the surface of earth because of these solids in the atmosphere they're also linked to respiratory issues like asthma um, and it's again produced when insufficient oxygen is in the reaction so it's another example of incomplete combustion so here are some images where they're actually removing particulates from surfaces so on this first one you can see that they are sandblasting the walls to remove the build-up from the industrial revolution off someone's house um, there's this church where they uh, managed to move it from the lower levels but it's still on the tower um, and that's just us seeing how that's collated onto those surfaces over time. Now there's a few other pollutants that are not technically from combustion or incomplete combustion. Okay, these pollu next pollutants form in a different way, so you might want to listen quite carefully on this one. These pollutants are called nitrogen oxides and sulphur dioxide. Now nitrogen oxides are caused when nitrogen and oxygen from the air actually react in engines due to the high temperatures and pressures inside that engine. So due to those different conditions, those gases that don't normally react do start to react and they form nitrogen oxides. Sulfur dioxide is caused when impurities in the fuels react with oxygen, sulfur impurities, and that's during that combustion process. Both of those pollutants cause acid rain, but they are both formed in different ways and you can be asked to describe how those pollutants form. Now, so acid rain has several effects, some of which are included below. So it's known to react with limestone statues and buildings. It can affect plant growth and it can also change the pH of rivers and lakes so that animals and plants living in those areas then cannot survive anymore. So let's go through a quick summary of those pollutants. So first of all, we have carbon dioxide, which is caused during complete combustion and is linked to global warming. Carbon monoxide is formed during incomplete combustion and is toxic. Also formed during incomplete combustion are carbon particulates, which are linked to global dimming. Then we've got nitrogen oxides, which form when nitrogen and oxygen from the air react inside the engine and form nitrogen oxides, and they are linked to acid rain. Also linked to acid rain is sulfur dioxide, which is formed when sulfur impurities react with oxygen in the engines and is, again, is also linked to acid rain. So now that we've gone through those one more time, I've put the table back up I'm going to give you a little bit of time to have a go at completing that table. If you need extra time, feel free to pause and then we'll go through the answers on the next slide. Okay, so now if you are wanting to check your answers, feel free to pause this slide, check you got them all correct. If you do need to go back and go through those one more time, we completely understand. Um, and then when you're ready, resume the video and we're going to go into a little bit more. So another question for us. Let's start applying that now. Shout out to my little puppy there sat in front of the fire. Um, we have a log burner in our house and it is a legal requirement to have a carbon monoxide detector in a house when you have a log burner. 
I want you to have a go at explaining why that is the case. Again, I'll give you some time. Okay, so let's check what you are. So if there is not enough oxygen, that's the first important part, then incomplete combustion will occur. That produces carbon monoxide, which is toxic and can build up in poorly ventilated areas. So this is an example of an exam question on this topic. We're gonna bug the question together and then I want you to pause the video and have a go at answering it and then resume and I'll go for a model answer to help you mark yours. So if we are bugging the question, the first thing we need to do is find the command word. And the command word in this situation is evaluate. If you are asked to evaluate, they want you to summarise the advantages and disadvantages to then justify a conclusion which means it's really important in evaluation that you use phrases such as in my opinion, however, I think that, and you are showing that there is a conclusion to your answer and you are justifying it. Now that we've got the command word, let's underline some key points, okay? So, first thing looking at the question, use the information and your knowledge and understanding to evaluate the use of biodiesel compared with fossil diesel as a fuel for cars. So that means that they are wanting you to use what's supplied, but then link that to your own knowledge. So let's look at this information and see what links we can make. So almost all of the crops that we eat can be converted into fuel for cars. Vegetable oils can be used as biodiesel and diesel from crude oil is called fossil diesel. When either biodiesel or fossil diesel burn, they both produce similar amounts of carbon dioxide. So, so far we're linking that to global warming, obviously. Both types of diesel produce carbon monoxide, which obviously is toxic. However, biodiesel produces fewer carbon particles and less sulfur dioxide. So make sure that each of those pollutants is being linked to its effect and you are making comparative statements throughout your answer. Pause this for a little bit, have a go at answering that question and then come back to us and resume when you are done. So you have unpaused, so let's have a look at how they mark evaluation questions. We are all aiming for a level three answer on this. So for a level three answer, we need a judgment. So we need your opinion on what fuel is the best. That should be strongly linked and logically supported by a sufficient range of correct reasons. So that means you should be getting the reasons from the information and linking those to your own knowledge, okay? To do that, you've probably used phrases like because. So let's have a look at an a model answer for you to compare to your. So in the first paragraph here, in my opinion, biodiesel is a better fuel. So straight away, we've got a judgment. This is because it produced less particulates than fossil diesel, 
which means it will contribute less to gl towards global dimming. That's our linking statement. Also, it produced less sulfur dioxide than fossil diesel, which means it will result in less acid rain. So in that first paragraph, we've got an opinion and two pieces of evidence with linked information. Great start. However, a disadvantage of biodiesel is that it's made from crops, which can be used for food. And this is unethical when there are worldwide food shortages. So that wasn't necessarily in the text that has come from that student's own knowledge. They did say it was made from food, but they've linked that to the fact that there is worldwide food shortages. A disadvantage of fossil diesel is that it's made from crude oil, which is a finite resource, whereas biodiesel is renewable as more crops can be planted. So again, more linking statements. So then the final paragraph, a disadvantage of both fuels is that they both produce carbon dioxide, which can cause global warming. However, as biodiesel is made from plants, this carbon dioxide can be taken in during the plant's growth, meaning that this fuel is carbon neutral, which is another reason why I think it is better than fossil diesel. So if we look at this, this has got a lot of points and, and the reason I wrote this one is so that you could see all of the points we could have got from that information. You wouldn't necessarily need to have every single one of these points, but you do need to have an opinion that's balanced with as much information as you can get linked to your own knowledge. So this is the end of the video now. So now I want you to move on to the questions on the form and I'll speak to you in the next video.